In his account of Jesus' life, John tells us how Jesus prayed for his followers as he anticipated his own death, resurrection, and ascension. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that, they may, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So for those, I don't know if we have any guests here this morning, but if so, I'm not Kurt, I'm not Pastor Kurt Kelly. Just, just to make that clear. Um, we will be praying for Kurt uh, a little bit later in our, in our prayers. Um, he had a, a bit of a setback, as some of you may know. He um, started spiking a fever last week. Uh, if, you, if you looked on his caring bridge, he put, a, uh, he put an update there. He started spiking a fever and I... I understand uh, that they've now determined that where his tricord is is where the infection is, and they're going to be removing that sometime today. So um, he was anticipating being back earlier, uh, well, I guess about the first part of June, he said. But um, it, it may have delayed it a bit. So please keep him in your prayers. Renee said he's a little bit down, uh, as can be expected. So please keep him in your prayers. Um, also, um, when you leave today, or maybe it was given to you on the way out today, uh, or on the way in today, there's a little half sheet. This is not a sermon outline, per se. Uh, just some thoughts for you to take home with you. You can reflect on them this afternoon or sometime this week. Or, oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> it's your choice. But I uh, just thought it would be something for you to kind of uh, reflect on it after I've done the sermon. Maybe it'll bring back some, some uh, thoughts that you may be having during this time. Um, in the prayers also, I'll be adding a prayer for Mother's Day uh, that's not included in the, in the um, bullet, so don't get thrown when I go a little bit off text here. Um, so, but I am a person. I am uh, Pastor Dana Brooks. Uh, I recently retired as a pastor. Um, I served down at Grace in Caldwell for about 10 years, and before that I served in three other parishes. I've been a pastor for about 35 years. Um, as I told uh, my congregation, I, I really, I really don't really consider myself a pastor anymore. Pastor means shepherd, and I don't have a flock, and so I, I don't really think of myself as, as a pastor. Um, I, uh, I, I'll say it gently, embarrassed. Um, so, yeah, I, some people want to say reverend. I really don't care for that term, so I prefer irreverend. So, if you're on the screen, uh, that would be that would probably. Be so grace, mercy, and peace are yours from our God through our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. An ancient legend tells of a conversation between Jesus and the angel Gabriel shortly after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And Gabriel asks him, now that you've completed the mission or that the Father sent you to do, what plans have you made? to ensure that the message of the forgiveness you earn will be spread throughout the world. And Jesus answered, well, I called some fishermen and tax collectors to walk along with me as I did my father's will. Gabriel said, yes, I, I know about them, but what other plans have you made? And Jesus replied, I taught Peter, and James, and John about the kingdom of God. I taught Thomas about faith. And all of them were with me as I healed and preached to the multitudes. But Gabriel still looked a little puzzled. He said, right, I, I know all of that, and all's well and good, but 
Surely you must have other plans to ensure that your mission continues. And Jesus fixed Gabriel with a steady gaze and he said, No, no, there is no other plan. I'm depending on them. As I said, that story is a legend, but I believe the conclusion is certainly accurate. Jesus is depending on his disciples, not just the disciples then, the disciples today, you and me. Jesus is depending on his disciples to spread his message of love, mercy, and compassion to the whole world, beginning with where you are today. His disciples, he didn't say it this way to Gabriel, but his disciples are plan A. There is no plan B. He made that clear when he charged them with these words. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Jesus is depending on his disciples. But he promised not to leave us alone. So as, we, as he spoke with his disciples, he didn't just end with those words. He said, go out and baptize, right? That's the way you do this. This is the way you make disciples. Go out and baptize and teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. Oh, and by the way, you're not going to be alone. I will be with you, even to the very end of the age. He said that, that he himself would be with us. And John records his promise to send us a helper. One who would come to empower, to give us what we need to spread his message. The first disciples knew this, just as we, his disciples today, know us, know that. In the liturgical calendar, last Thursday, last Thursday this past Thursday, was, was the Ascension Day. That's the day of Ascension. And it was on that day that Jesus bodily rose, bodily left his disciples, and went to reign in power at the right hand of God. Next Sunday we observe, what? Somebody's, a couple of people are dressed in the right colors today. Pentecost. Pentecost. Next Sunday, on that day, 50 days after Easter, 10 days after the Ascension, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples. Poured out on all the believers in Christ. On Pentecost, the church was officially born as the one Jesus promised to send, poured out on his people the gifts that they would need to carry out his mission. But during those 10 days between Ascension and Pentecost, the disciples waited. And I wonder what that waiting must have been like for them. Before Good Friday, Jesus had told them that he would send them the Holy Spirit. Told them that they would not be alone. But now, almost two months later, ten days after Pentecost, Jesus has left them. And I wonder what was going through their minds. You know, two months is a pretty long time. I imagine they felt maybe somewhat confused and find it kind of hiding away in an upper room on the day of Pentecost. That must have been... Uh, what were they thinking? Were they, were they wondering what's going to happen next? Where are we going to be? What's, were, they, were they a little scared? Did they feel alone? Were they insecure? Were they perplexed? I think probably a lot of that stuff. And his ascension, they watched Jesus ascend into heaven... That must have been pretty shocking. I mean, you just don't see things like that every day. In our day of special movie effects, CGI, that, that may be all old school by now, but we might just say, hey, you know, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, I just saw a picture this morning of the uh, Northern Lights, and that's pretty cool. I mean, we see some pretty wonderful things. But what about what about them? How did seeing their friend, their teacher, their Lord, rise into the air and then out of sight make them feel? Maybe it gave them some, some confidence. I mean, like I said, you don't see those kind of things every day. 
maybe something like that that was so incredible gave them a little bit of the feeling that well now anything anything might be possible on the other hand now they had to face the reality that they were alone and they knew not for how long for the disciples this waiting time was truly an in-between time. An in-between the time they had Jesus with them before, they, before that time that they would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They were still waiting for something. But they didn't know exactly what or when. They knew Jesus had told them to go and make disciples and that they were to wait in Jerusalem for something, but they certainly must have felt inadequate to the task. I don't know, can, can you relate to those disciples? I can. We're kind of waiting right now, aren't we? And sometimes that waiting is not so easy. Sometimes things happen in our lives that make it rather difficult to wait. We're not waiting for the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to send the Holy Spirit. We already got that. That's, that's one good thing. We know... He did that, and most of us here don't know him really anything different than being spirit-filled Christians. I don't know. I, I'm, taking, I'm making kind of an assumption here. There may be some who are new Christians, but most of us maybe have been raised in the faith. Never knew what it was like to be lost. I've always been certain of his forgiveness. What a gift that is. But it's been almost 2,000 years. And in a way, we're still waiting. Still wondering what's next and when and what's it going to be like. And that's why I think the gospel lesson this morning is so appropriate for this time of waiting. In that section of John, Jesus prayed for those who would bear the responsibility to tell the world about him. If his disciples would remember that conversation with Jesus... If they could remember these words, the in-between time that they found themselves in might not seem so unsettling, so lonely. That gospel lesson is a portion of what's known as Jesus' high priestly prayer. The prayer Jesus prayed for his disciples less than 24 hours before his arrest and crucifixion. They would see him brutally tortured and then die for those uh, for those things that were about to happen. He would see them. They would, they would see him brutally tortured. And, and this is what happens when you are somewhere new and you feel a little nervous. So give me, give me just a second. <laughs> they would see him brutally tortured and then die. And after that, they would see him again after his resurrection. But now, after his ascension, after the lows that preceded and the highs that followed Easter... They could really appreciate what Jesus was saying, what he meant in that prayer. He prayed, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus prayed that his disciples would remain in the faith, that they would remain true to the teaching that he had given them. And that's critically important during the waiting time. You know, it, it would have been so tempting for the disciples to discount all that Jesus had taught them. It would have been easy for them to say, well, let's, let's go back to the fishing boats. If you're familiar with John, you know that they did that before his ascension. Peter was like, one morning got up and said, I'm going fishing. And Jesus came to them, remember this, he met them on the shore, and he reinstated Peter. Three times he was denied, Jesus was denied by Peter, and three times Jesus said, take care of my flock, be their shepherd. So, while it would have been easy maybe to go back to something we know we can do. They didn't do that. You 
You see, I believe they did remember this prayer of Jesus. The Apostle Paul, or excuse me, John certainly remembered it. He, empowered by the Holy Spirit, he wrote it down, word for word. And it's not short. It takes up a couple chapters. I believe it was trust in Jesus' promises. Trust in what he prayed for them that really gave them the strength and the courage to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of that Spirit. And that waiting time, I think, it was kind of like a sailboat that's tied up to the dock. A brisk wind allowed other ships, other sailboats to cut across the lake, but that sailboat hovered helplessly next to the dock. The breeze wasted on its loose sails. All the power was at hand. The wind drenched the boat with its force. It was ready, but the boat didn't move because the person at the tiller wasn't equipped, didn't have the wisdom to use the power of the equipment. He didn't have the knowledge to set the rigging or how to direct the craft to receive all the power that surrounded it. The disciples were exactly like that. Jesus had spelled out the mission. They had those tools at hand, but they didn't know how to use them. They didn't know how to set, to set sail until the Spirit was poured out upon them. We have that Spirit. They needed that Pentecost experience, but we now have that, that power, the guidance of the Spirit to get us on our way. And that's why Jesus prayed what He did. That while they waited, they would be drawn together, that they would not lose faith, that they would remain in the Father. Those are important words for us to hear as well. Because I think Jesus is praying not just for the disciples of that day, but for us. Jesus prays for us to remain in the faith, to remain together, for the, to face those waiting times of our lives. There are many times, I believe, when you and I are not quite sure of our faith, not quite sure of the Lord's presence, when we're clueless about what's going to happen next, have no idea what the future holds for us. I think maybe we can all relate to that right now in our culture and our society. <laughs> continues to just play. And that's when it's important to remember the words of Jesus. It's good to know that even when we're confused, even when we don't know what's going to happen, even if we can't get our boat sailing the way we'd like to, it's important to remember that we still have that relationship with Jesus, that Jesus is still with us. We still have faith. We can still cling to those promises. We might feel in between, but we know Jesus is still here for us and with us. Life is tough. We lose loved ones. We face sicknesses. Sometimes we're confused about our relationships with family members or our spouse. And those situations, times when we go from one emotion to another, wondering where we're going to get the strength to carry on, can be difficult, can be daunting. And those are the situations when we need to cling to those words of Jesus, when we need to hold on to them for dear life. He says, I'm with you. Remain in me. Believe in me. I will give you the power to see you through. I'll be with you. And just as those words comforted the disciples who were waiting for the promised Holy Spirit, they also comforted us. In our waiting time, Jesus tells us to remain in faith because our waiting time means that we're not alone. That God is always with us. And it's important to notice this as well. Because this is something I think that we have that the disciples didn't have as readily. It's important to notice that Jesus not only prays for the faith of the disciples, he prays that they will be in his truth. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus asks the Father to strengthen the disciples, and as he does, he points them and he points us to where that truth is found. It's found in the Word of God. You see, before we can have confidence in His promises, we need to know what His promises are. 
and his promises are contained in his word. In that gift that we have that we so often, I'm sorry, take for granted. As the disciples faced an in-between time between the Ascension and Pentecost, they needed to cling to these words of Jesus. They needed to remember how important it is that they remain together, that they hold on to the truth, that even though they saw Jesus leave them, they really were not alone. And we have the, we have the benefit of knowing we are not alone. We know what Jesus did and sent his spirit to us. In our everyday living, we know that Jesus prayed, and as Paul said, is praying for us. That's the truth that we have to hold on, hold on to. Sometimes that's all we have to hold on to. But isn't that enough? It may feel like Jesus is far away, but we are never really alone. We have his word. We have his, we have his promise on that 